In the 1890s, a few years after the state of Montana became a state, there was a very public debate about where that state's capital should be. There were two cities in the running, Helena and Anaconda. Each city had a multi-zillionaire copper baron pulling for it. The two men were known as the Copper Kings of Montana. And in order to win the vote and therefore benefit their own companies and their own fortunes, these two guys did stuff like sponsor parades and speeches and fireworks. They distributed free cigars and drinks and $5 bills to win people's loyalty. After millions of dollars were spent in the 1890s, the city of Helena won to the joy of one of those copper barons and to the sorrow of the other. Decades after that fight, the people of Montana decided to pass something called the Corrupt Practices Act to keep that sort of corporate influence out of their state politics. Because of the history of the Copper Kings, Montana has long thought about these things differently than the rest of the states. And they still do. In December, the Montana Supreme Court essentially thumbed their noses at the U.S. Supreme Court by upholding their state's ban on corporate money in state politics, regardless of the Citizens United ruling. But this past Friday, the U.S. Supreme Court stopped Montana from enforcing the limits that they want to put on corporate donations in politics at the state level until the Supreme Court can decide on the Montana case. Now, we don't know if the Supreme Court's going to hear that case or when it will even decide whether to hear it. But until then, post Citizens United and pre whatever they're going to decide about Montana, we are all still living in a billionaire's world. Today's the day that we got the tiny little bit of disclosure that we do get from the super PACs that have overtaken our presidential elections. And while you might think a while as a human before writing a $5 check or a $15 check or a $50 check to a candidate, these guys funding these PACs write $500,000 checks for their given candidates because who knows? I mean, the only thing we know for sure is that they have that kind of change sitting in their checking accounts. And money being given in chunks that big means that individual decisions by individual named billionaires can make all of the difference in the world to a presidential campaign. The whole reason we still think of Newt Gingrich's campaign as alive is because of the news that one guy, his casino billionaire guy, is reportedly thinking about pumping another $10 million into the Gingrich side over the next few days. So Mr. Gingrich doesn't really need other humans to donate to him. Just one guy's decision can keep that presidential campaign at least vaguely viable. Same thing, frankly, with Rick Santorum. When his billionaire or his multi-hundred millionaire started doing the media rounds last week, talking about how women need to keep an aspirin between their knees to avoid getting pregnant, uh, Mr. Santorum tried to deflect the fallout from that by saying, hey, I can't be held accountable for what my supporters say. And that's broadly true. You can't hold a politician accountable for everything said by somebody who supports them. But Foster Fries is not just a person who supports Rick Santorum. In some ways, he's the person who makes Rick Santorum possible. He's essentially Rick Santorum's sole major donor. He is Rick Santorum's billionaire. Ron Paul also has a billionaire, naturally a libertarian-minded billionaire. The eccentric founder of PayPal has donated nearly $2 million to Congressman Paul's side. And then there's Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney naturally has a lot of billionaires. Given who Mitt Romney is, you might think he doesn't even need one. But Glenn Greenwald at Salon.com has been writing recently about an Idaho billionaire who is Mitt Romney's national campaign finance co-chair. And frankly, it looks like an act of bravery, both for Glenn and for Salon.com, to publish anything about this gentleman. His name is Frank Vandersloot. He's described in local press reports as a billionaire. He lives in Idaho. In addition to being the national finance co-chair for the Mitt Romney presidential campaign, he also runs a company called Melaluca, which sells all sort of household products. Mr. Vandersloot has involved himself in a number of political causes in Idaho over the years in what would seem to be a very high-profile kind of way, but he has taken a very aggressive stance toward anybody reporting on his political involvements. For example, in 1999, Idaho Public Television planned to air a documentary about how elementary school kids were being taught in school about issues of sexual orientation. Mr. Vandersloot and his company led the opposition to the documentary being aired by paying for billboards to be put up across the state, railing against the documentary and warning about the, quote, homosexual lifestyle. In 2005, a local newspaper called the Post Register ran an award-winning investigative series about how the Boy Scouts organization had tried to cover up allegations of sexual abuse in Idaho. As Glenn, as Glenn Greenwald writes at Salon, the series detailed how a Mormon bishop knew of one scout leader's pedophile history, yet still recommended him as a scout master, and how top-level local and national leaders of the Mormon church had also received warnings about the scout master. Mr. Vandersloot responded to that series in that local Idaho paper by taking out this full-page ad in the same paper, 
attacking the credibility of the reporting and outing the reporter who broke outing the reporter who broke the story, outing him as a quote homosexual. That reporter, Peter Zuckerman, had not come out to his friends and neighbors in Idaho yet. And according to his editor, after those full-page ads started running, quote, strangers started ringing Peter's doorbell at midnight, and his partner of five years was fired from his job. Mr. Vandersloot's rise to prominence as an important supporter of not only Mitt Romney, but also Idaho's Republican Senator James Risch, has led other people to report on his political activity and, and raise questions about whether or not his politics, particularly on gay rights issues, uh, are shared by the candidates that he supports. A number of reporters who have raised those questions have very quickly found themselves to be targets of Mr. Vandersloot's lawyers. In February, a blogger with a website called The Idaho Agenda wrote a piece titled, Romney Receives Big Money from Idaho's Not-So-Gay-Friendly Melaleuca Company. After publishing that piece, which described Mr. Vandersloot's history on gay issues in Idaho, that blogger, quote, received an accusatory letter from a Melaleuca lawyer. But before he could respond to the letter, he received a follow-up missive by email from a different company lawyer demanding compliance. When the blogger emailed back to say he was working on a response, the Melaleuca lawyer responded, we really need to address this issue today or else we will have to consider escalating this issue to a much more serious level. Similarly, back in 2007, an independent journalist in Idaho authored a piece on Mr. Vandersloot's support for Idaho's current Republican Senator James Risch. In the article, she talked about Mr. Vandersloot's involvement in the issue of that gay documentary that was to be aired on Idaho public television. For that dip into true history, she too says she received a warning letter from Mr. Vandersloot's lawyers accusing her of defamation. According to Glenn's reporting at Salon, she also included the official photograph of Vandersloot taken from the Melaleuca website. In response, she was sent a letter from Melaleuca's counsel accusing her of copyright infringement for using the photo. After another website writing about Mr. Vandersloot decided to post the letter that they received from Melaleuca's lawyers, quote, Melaleuca responded, this is amazing, by obtaining an after-the-fact copyright certificate for that lawyer's letter, then demanding that the hosting company remove the letter from the website on the ground that it constituted copyright infringement. The hosting company promptly complied, and Melaleuca then sued the website for copyright infringement for having published the now copyrighted lawyer's letter without their consent. So this is the national finance co-chair of the Mitt Romney for President campaign. And this is what we know from the public record about his activism, his political views, and his apparent strategy for dealing with people who report on him. But he also serves as a good general reminder. Billionaires have always had a ton of weight to throw around in this country, going back to the days of the Copper Kings of Montana, right? And they have always used that weight for all sorts of reasons, including trying to shape what we are able to know about how exactly they throw their weight around. But now in this post-Citizens United world we are living in, these billionaires, who frankly have never been wanting for influence in the country in the first place. Now in this post-Citizens United world, they are the ones we've decided to also hand our elections over to, because they needed that too. Ta-da.